uh, two, two, uh, the first two uh, lectures on more basic material, uh, which I think will be uh, serve as a foundation for all the speakers uh, of this conference. Uh, so I will go a little bit fast because it's, it should be stuff that you that you know you've heard of, and then you can dig deeper um, if there are things that I mentioned today that that, that you don't already know. Um, by the way, I've, I've written a book with Jean-Philippe Bouchot uh, that came out about a year and a half ago. Um, if you want to buy a, a, a nice hard copy, uh, you can. It's, it's quite expensive as all academic books. Uh, I think it's uh, available uh, on the web uh, illegally for free. Um, I, don't, I don't care. Go ahead and, and download it if, if you can find it. Um, I'm not collecting any royalties anyway. Um, uh, okay, so, but, but a lot of what I'm saying is in this book, uh, and, and there's a lot more in the book than, than what I will be able to say in these uh, six uh, sessions. Okay, so I want to talk about random matrices. Um, so, and, and why are random matrices more interesting or at least different than random numbers? If I give you a random number, so suppose I give you a random number 0.7, you can't do much with 0.7. It's, it's just a number. You, you, you don't know the distribution, you don't know the mean, etc. Whereas if, you get, if I give you a very large matrix, this uh, uh, matrix has n square elements, and if n square uh, goes to infinity or for physicists or applied people, very large, say n is, an, n is, a, is a thousand or a million, well, you, you easily get uh, millions of entries or, or thousands of billions of entries. And so you can do statistics just directly on the entries of a matrix. And then you have phenomena that happen uh, such as self-averaging, that certain quantities that you can compute on one single matrix, because the matrix is so large that these quantities these actually tell you something about the ensemble of matrix that this was drawn from. So this is why um, I find uh, random matrix theory interesting and why, and what this concept of self-averaging, the mathematician will, will talk about concentration, concentration of measure, which means that the probability of something uh, is extremely concentrated on, on one point and it's, it's to, for all practical purpose, it becomes non-random, okay? So the kind of matrix I'm gonna talk about are gonna be uh, self-adjoint, so I have a matrix A that will be equal to uh, its adjoint. Um, I will talk mostly with, uh, I will do everything with real matrices, but uh, since I, I'm only talking about distribution of eigenvalues and, and, um, and outliers, all this is the same whether the matrix is real or complex. Okay, so actually I will use a transpose because I will be thinking about uh, real matrices, but everything I say will be true for emission matrices, where you need to take the complex conjugate when you take the transpose. And so, so these matrices have real eigenvalues. And this is, this is one, one reason we study them because non-self-adjoint matrices uh, can have, uh, well, are not always diagonalizable. The, 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 the eigenvalues com, can be complex, but with these matrices, we're safe. All the eigenvalues are real, okay? And we're gonna talk about, I'm gonna define sort of moments of, of, of matrices. So I'm going to have a, a moment operator or an expectation value operator, which I will call tau, which tau of a matrix will be simply one over n trace of the matrix. Okay. And, um, and since these matrices will be diagonalizable, I can always look at, uh, at this in terms of the eigenvalues, and this will be one over n sum over k of lambda k, lambda, to, uh, lambda k. Okay. So, this, so, this, so this is kind of an expectation value. Um, and the point is, uh, is that uh, another thing I, I want to say is that the matrices we're going to look at will have a spectrum of eigenvalues that, that, are, that is bounded, okay? So there'll be a largest eigenvalue and a smallest eigenvalue, and even if, as n goes to infinity, um, uh, the, 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 the eigenvalues are bounded, and so all the moments exist, okay? So I can define then the moment of a... Of a so I can say define tau of a to the k, and this I will call the m the the k moment of a matrix. So here, okay, I'll be sort of going back and forth between sort of averages and specific matrix. So this is this is the moment k of this specific matrix, okay. But all these things will, will converge uh, in the large n limit. Um, so this, this why this why I'll be a bit sloppy sometimes. Uh, when I say MK, do I mean the, the k moment of that specific matrix, which is which really means one over n trace of that matrix to the power k, which is really the same as one over n sum over L of lambda to L to the power k. 
Okay, so th this is a, a specific uh, moment of that specific matrix. But when the matrix is extremely large, this actually converge to the the to the um, the moment of the distribution. Okay. Um, yes. And, and, and this is one of, one of these quantities that I, that I call self-averaging. Okay. So um, one very important tool to study uh, random matrices, that, that especially bounded random matrices, well, well, this, this, the, it sounds very strict to say that, that I'm looking at bounded objects, but it turns out that, that most random matrices that we, one encounters are actually bounded. So we'll talk about, about the Wigner ensemble, where, the, where the, 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 the distribution of eigenvalues is a semicircle, and it's strictly bounded. There, unlike, unlike the Gaussian, for instance, if you look in classical probability distribution, the, one of the most natural distribution you encounter is, is the Gaussian, and the Gaussian is not bounded. Uh, so the tools that were introduced, like the Stilges transform, is not very good at dealing with unbounded objects. But for random matrices, the spectrum turns out to be very often bounded, and therefore the, the Stilges transform is a very strong tool to use with, with bounded objects. Okay, so what is this, this still just transform? Well, before I, I define it, I will define the resolvent. So the resolvent is a matrix. Uh, it's a matrix function. So we'll call G of Z for a certain matrix A. And it's just the, the matrix Z identity minus A inverse. So what is it? It's a function of a complex. It's a, so it's a function of a complex variable Z and it's, it's, a, it's, a fun, it's a matrix function. So if A is a random matrix, this is a random function. Uh, it's a, okay, so, so this is a it's, a, it's a random matrix that depends on the complex uh, parameter. So, uh, but this will be very useful because uh, this object, if you look at it in terms of, its, of the eigenvalues of A, if you, you can write it as sum over L of VL, VL transpose, uh, Z minus lambda L, where lambda L and V L are the eigenvalues and eigenvectors of, of the matrix A. Okay, so what it is, what it is, it's it's a sum of rank one objects of projectors with a pole at uh, at the corresponding uh, eigenvalue. Okay, so if you zoom in on, so if you zoom in on this pole, you'll be able to fi to find a projector on the eigenvalue. So this will be useful. I'll come back a lot to this uh, to this resolvent. Okay, but for for now, I just wanted to take the, the trace uh, of this object, and 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 again, my traits are always normalized. So I'll define the Stilges transform, G of Z, as the normalized trace of this resolvent matrix. Okay, or which is the same as one over n sum. Uh, well. I can run over and trace of Z identity minus A inverse, which in terms of the eigenvalues of A is the same as one over N sum over L of one over Z minus lambda L. Okay, so this is a, it's a random function because A is a random matrix, its eigenvalues are random. But the point is that uh, almost everywhere uh, this, uh, this function will converge for when when the, the matrix is large this actually becomes a deterministic function okay so we'll we'll see that everywhere except uh where there are eigenvalues okay so so how do you see that this function g of z this uh, this function of complex variable um converges to a deterministic function well let's look at it um let's see let's okay So let's look at this random function for z uh, for z uh, outside the real line. So for, so I'll, I'll look at z equals x, a real number minus i eta. So I'm just I, I put myself below the, the real axis. Okay. So for I'm, I take some complex z and I look I, I give it a, a negative imaginary part and I looked at the value of this function. So I can just um, Right, G of Z, which is the same as G of X plus minus I eta, and is uh, right as one over N sum over L of one over X, let me put minus lambda L minus I eta. OK, 
Okay. And as usual, when you have a complex number denominator, it's better to, to use a complex conjugate and to, to put the, the complex uh, number on uh, the numerator. So I get one over N sum over L of X minus Lambda L. It's a real part plus I eta over the real part square plus eta square. Um, the eigenvalues are their and eigenvalues. Okay. Now let me just focus on the imaginary part. So this is real, this is imaginary, and this is a real number at the bottom. So I can now try to uh, fo try to understand the. Uh, I, I can do the real part, but I'll just I'll just focus today on the on the imaginary part of this object. And so I have that the imaginary part of G of x minus i eta is just um, uh, one over N sum over L of eta over X minus Lambda L square plus eta square. Okay, now if you look at this object here, this, this ratio, that's what it's, that's what it's called the, the Cauchy kernel, okay? So up to a factor of pi, uh, which is normalization. So let me write this this way. So it's one over N sum over L of um, K eta of uh, X minus Lambda L. Okay. And, uh, and then I'll, I need to put a pi and I always forget where to, where to put the pi. Um, just see my notes because I'll, I'll always get this wrong. So um, yeah, I need to pi, put a pi here. Okay, and, and so I define this object k eta as one over pi uh, eta over uh, as a function of say y, y square plus eta square. Okay, and this is a Cauchy kernel, what it looks like, it's a function that's centered at zero, uh, has power law tails, the maximum and then power law tail, and has width uh, eta, okay. And it has integral one. That's why I call it a kernel. So this is an object that this is a, just a, an object of, of with eta and integral one. And so what I'm doing here, what I'm saying is that G evaluated at X and with an imaginary part is essentially the convolution of the discrete distribution of the lambdas. So, remember, so think of my matrix. Uh, my, so these are, so if you look at the eigenvalues of my matrix, I have some, some eigenvalues, lambda one, lambda two, lambda three, ta, 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 to lambda n. So it has n eigenvalues. This is, this, the, this is kind of the empirical distribution I have for each eigenvalue, and these are random. And then I convolute this with a kernel of width eta. So basically over, over each eigenvalue, I, um, I, I do a little kernel like this. Okay. And then I sum this. So I'll get a smooth curve, which is just basically just a convolution of this discrete uh, set of eigenvalues and, and this kernel. Okay. Now, the point is that if eta is large enough, so, uh, so I must say also as well that, so, Lambda, so typically there's going to be a smallest eigenvalue, which I'll typically denote lambda minus, and the largest eigenvalue lambda plus, which are really the not lambda minus and lambda plus are more like the edge of the spectrum, where lambda one is the uh, the the uh, the smallest eigenvalue on that particular sample. So the notation is slightly different, but I'm, I'm abusing it a little bit by. Uh, saying that lambda minus and lambda one are essentially the same in this problem. Okay, so what I'm saying is that since all my eigenvalues are bounded, I have typically a distance one over n between eigenvalues. Okay, so so depending on the density, but if if the density if, and again there are also other cases where I could have a Dirac mass, but I, I for now I'm not I'm not considering this. So I'm supposing I have a I have a all my eigen, eigenvalues are spread out. Then, because they're they're spread out on a, over a finite interval, the typical distance between them is one over n. And so, if I have eta that's much greater than one over n, then 
then actually the picture is more like this. So every kernel um, uh, encompass quite a lot of eigenvalue, actually infinitely, infinitely many as n goes to infinity. And so by sort of the law of large numbers, uh, this convolution of this random, um, th this random distribution of eigenvalue with a, with a, with a broad kernel uh, gives a, a deterministic answer. Okay, so this is, this is, this is the reason why for, for eta much greater than one over n, I could claim that G of X minus I eta, uh, which I would say um, for a given matrix A converges to G mu, if you want, of X minus I eta, where this is, or it's, or it, 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 or it's, one, it's equal to its average, to its expectation value. It doesn't depend on the sample. So this is very important self-averaging property uh, of the Steeljes transform, and this is true. Well, it's it's true only away from the real axis. It's very important that, that there's an imaginary part, and it's important that the imaginary part is big enough. But as n goes to infinity, um, the the imaginary part could be as small as I want. So I could, uh, if I if I fix eta and I, I have a, a sequence of matrices that are bigger and bigger and bigger, at some point the matrix will be big enough that eta will be considered small enough and this thing will converge, okay? Now, the other thing that's, that's nice about the fact that n goes to infinity, I can, if n goes to infinity, I can always find an eta that's much, much smaller than one, but much, much bigger than one over n. So, for instance, typically in application, you would say if you take eta to be of order one over square root of n. Okay. If I so I, I'm going to pick an eta that's again much much bigger than one over n. So when I when I smooth out with eta, I, I get the law of large numbers and I get a deterministic answer. But on the other hand, um, I want eta to be extremely small so that I'm probing this the the function. Uh, with a very small kernel and what happens then is that um, uh, I, um, I, I'm basically pr uh, probing I'm, I'm probing the, 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 the function with a, with a kernel that goes to zero so when, when I'm well I'm just gonna gonna write it um, the argument is a bit weak here but rho of lambda well any um, uh, maybe I should have written this before. Okay, so, damn it. sorry, my argument is a bit clumsy. Uh, maybe go back a little bit. So what I'm saying is that when eta is large enough, when eta is large enough, um, I don't see the individual eigenvalues. I just see the distribution. And the distribution I, I'm claiming, uh, uh, the distribution of eigenvalue of one sample is the same of the distribution of eigenvalues of, uh, of the ensemble. And so when I compute the Stilges transform at a certain value of eta, I get the, the, I get the convolution of the, the, the density of eigenvalues with this kernel. And now that I have this expression, I can let the kernel size to be as small as possible so it becomes a Dirac. Okay? And in that limit, I just, I, I, I get, the, 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 the limit where eta goes to zero, but you really have to think that eta goes to zero in this way. So eta must stay much greater than one over n, and, but, but, it, but it becomes extremely small. So for instance, and this is a good choice, eta goes, eta b eta is one over square root of n, then you can let eta goes to zero, and then you, you, you get the, um, uh, you get the density. So I have a factor of pi here, and so you get pi times the density. Okay, so this is a very important formula that, that at least definitely in my um, I've learned in physics, but uh, it took me a while to realize where it came from. It's called the the, the let me write it uh, more. Okay, so I'm saying two I'm saying two things. Let me write G n for a fixed size n so i'm saying two things i'm saying that this converges to a fixed function 
Okay. Uh, for um, so for if I if I exclude the real axis, okay, and I, I could actually compute it outside where the their eigenvalues, but I, I've only shown you. So if I, if I take a complex Z away from the real axis, then the, the um, these these steel just transform compute on one sample converge to uh, the steel just transform of the ensemble. And the other thing that I've shown here of eta goes to zero plus of this function, G of X minus I eta, I get pi rho of X. And this is called the, the plem. Uh, I always forget how to write this word. His name is uh, uh, Plemelge formula. Okay, so it says that the steel just transform encodes the um, uh, uh, encodes the, um, the the density. Okay, imaginary part. Sorry, yeah, exactly. Okay, and the. Um, and 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 the uh, the real part will converge to the Hilbert transform. Okay, but I, that I, I don't have time to show. Okay, because I'm already. Okay, so those are basic facts that I want. Okay. But I really because for practical application, it, it, it's actually um, it actually matters that, that that essentially what I want to say is that adding an imaginary part to the steel just transform sort of blurs. It, 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 so the, I think the, the really important thing is that adding an imaginary part to the steel just transform is like uh, convoluting with a Cauchy kernel. And if, if the imaginary part is big, you can with a, with a broad Cauchy kernel. And as, as the imaginary part gets small, you converge almost, with, you, you, convolute, you make a convolution with a Dirac, which gives you back the, um, up to a factor of pi, it gives you back the, um, the, the, the density. Um, and, and so th therefore you could also, so once you have the, this density, you can rewrite the steel just transform then uh, as a density. Okay, so this is the limiting the steel just transform. You can write as an integral, say if, if the spectrum goes from lambda plus to lambda minus. Okay, so you can write it in, in integral form. So the steel just transform, so here maybe I should rewrite the definition. Gn is for a given is one over n sum over l of one over z lambda l. So this is for one matrix, and it converges to this this thing that that only depends on the density of eigenvalues. Okay. Um, another few things that you could say. So, um, and again, on the real axis, this is not true. On the real axis, this is a this is a random function. Uh, if you pick an if you pick a Z on the real axis that's close to an eigenvalue of that particular matrix, you could have a huge number. So this is a, this is a real function. Uh, actually, on the real axis, this is a real function that that has jumps. I mean, it's 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 extremely wild. If I, if I sort of wanted to plot it, it would it would behave like this. It would have uh, poles everywhere. It sort of goes like this. So it it, it sort of diverges to infinity. Uh, up and down every time there's an eigenvalue, okay? Where typically something like this, it has a branch cut. So instead of having a, a large amount of poles, like it has n poles and n goes to infinity, uh, this function with poles, uh, again, on the real axis, it doesn't converge, but outside the real axis, actually all these poles as seen from above, from, seen from far away, just look like a branch cut, okay? And this is quite important. So, so this kind of formula gives you give you a branch cut between lambda minus and lambda plus, but elsewhere on the complex plane, it's perfectly analytic. And in particular, it's analytic at uh, at z goes to infinity. So as z goes to infinity, this behaves as uh, one over z. Okay. So the densities are normalized. So when z is extremely large, this becomes just one, and this this tends as one over z. Okay. And actually, you could you could do a, an expansion, and and you also you, and again, you could you could also show this this sort of convergence as a as a power series at infinity. It's another way to see this this convergence of this complex function.
So it's fairly simple to see that if you if you take uh, this formula and you expand it in powers of z at infinity, um, uh, just write the result, you get the g of z equals sum l equals um, zero to infinity ml over z to the l plus one. So you, re you recover the, the, the moments, remember m ml is just uh, one over n sum of lambda, I'm sort of mixing k's and l, but so these are these are the sample moments of of that particular matrix, and this converges to uh, so this would be a Gn. And it converges to Gz, which which is which actually I'll write the same expression. Well, except that here maybe I put a little n. This is for that particular matrix, and then here these moments converge to the moment of the distribution of the eigenvalues. In particular, this would be as one over z plus m one, one over z square plus m two, uh, z cube plus order one over z four. So you can you so g g uh, is analytic at infinity, and this is a and it, and it's actually the moment generating function of the moments of uh, of this density row. Okay. So. Uh, I want to look at one particular case. So a, a, a random matrix we should all know, be familiar with is the, is the Wigner ensemble, which I will write as, I'll write the matrix X is a Wigner matrix. I'll write as H plus H transpose over square root of two N. But I, and, and H here is a IID matrix. Uh, that's not symmetric. So, so I want X to be a symmetric matrix. So if the Wigner ensemble is, is a symmetric matrix. So the way I build my symmetric matrix is by taking a non-symmetric matrix and adding it, uh, its transpose. Uh, I have um, some normalization factor of square root of two n, and in the in the in the matrix I could take it normal zero one, but I'll take it normal zero sigma squared. So I have a parameter sigma squared. Okay. But a unit a unit um, Wigner matrix would have with elements here normal zero one and and the moments that you have, you have the, the, the the mean is zero and the variance is sigma squared okay that's why i chose this normalization here okay and now i would like to compute if i can compute the Steeljes transform of this ensemble i will i can get the density just at looking at the imaginary part okay and again i won't do the computation but what you can do is you can look at this matrix. That's, this is, so again, I'm all thinking about this in, in large n limit, but I could look at the one one element in the corner of that matrix. Um, so again, what I wanna do is compute the resolvent um, Z identity minus X, take the inverse. This is a resolvent, this is a resolvent matrix, and then take the normalized trace of this object. So I need to invert a large matrix. If I take the one one element and I use Schur's complement, and then I do some averaging, I won't do the computation. I quickly get an equation that looks like this. Is I take the expectation value of one over G of Z equals um, Z minus uh, Sigma square expectation value of G. G of Z. Now, um, and I've also used one more trick here. I've assumed that if I look at one, the element one, one, and the rest, look at the rest of the matrix, the rest of the matrix is, is also a Wigner matrix of size uh, N minus one, and the Wigner matrix of size N minus one is really the same thing as a Wigner matrix of size N, as N goes to infinity, and N and N minus one are the same thing. So this is how I get uh, such an equation. Okay. There are many, many ways to get an equation. You can, um, but anyway, okay. And 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 since I argue that if z is not on the real axis, or it's at least not on where the where the eigenvalues are, if if, if z is far from any eigenvalue on the real axis or elsewhere in the complex plane, then this function g of z uh, converges uh, to the non-random 
And so I can get rid of the eigenvalues and I get the following expression that one over G equals uh, Z minus sigma squared G. Okay. So this is the equation that that's satisfied by the steel just transform of a, uh, of a Wigner ensemble. Okay. And, and this is a, it's a very simple quadratic equation in G. So I can just solve it. Okay. Um, as, as two nice things. Uh, also later it will allow me to convert uh, to compute the, the inverse, but let me, let me first show you the solution, which you should all know as well. At least you should know the, you should know the density. So the steel just transformed into the Wigner ensemble. You have to be slightly careful because it's a quadratic equation. You'll get two roots and only one is the physical one and the physical root depend on Z. So you have to be careful how you write it. But if you do things carefully, you get that for a Wigner, you get uh, this expression. Let me write it as Z times one minus square root of one minus four sigma squared over z squared over two sigma squared. Okay, so this is a steel just transform of a Wigner ensemble with variance sigma of with variance sigma squared. And if you put sigma squared equals one, you get the unit uh, Wigner ensemble. I've written it this way because you see there's a square root and the square root is singular when the, um, when, when the, the inside crosses zero and I want this to be analytical for Z big. So when Z is big, uh, this is small and this is an analytical function. So this is why I put it this way. So if you look at it in the complex plane, you get two numbers, you get uh, two sigma here, minus two sigma and two sigma, you'll get a branch cut here, but outside the branch cut, the function, so for, so for Z large, so you're outside of this branch cut, this is perfectly analytical function that you could expand at infinity. So this is why I chose this. Uh, if, if you write Z square minus, then you have, you have, you have, you have to, it's, uh, it's never clear when you should take the plus sign or the minus sign. But whereas you put one over uh, Z square in the, in, in, the, in the square root, then you get an expression that, uh, that's correct everywhere and analytical everywhere, except on the real axis between minus two sigma and, and plus two sigma. Okay, and from this, um, this still just transform, you can recover the, um, the, the density. So I said that if I take the imaginary part of G of X minus I eta, I will get pi times the density of eigenvalues at X. Okay, and you see that this thing, uh, for this to have an imaginary part, the, here I, actually I need to be on the branch cut. Okay, and you, you quickly convince yourself that rho of lambda must be equal to, um, uh, what is it? It's um, four lambda, no, so lambda squared minus four sigma squared, square root over two pi sigma squared. Okay, so this is the Wigner, then this, this, if you draw this distribution, it's a semicircle that goes from minus two sigma to two sigma. And it's properly normalized and everything. Okay, so this is the Wigner semicircle law that you get for for uh, for the Wigner ensemble, okay. and it has the properties that we want, mean, namely that uh, it's analytic elsewhere, uh, everyone their complex plane except where their eigenvalues, and it's real. And outside the, with another important thing I need is that, oh, if, if I call this lambda plus and this is called lambda minus. Beyond lambda plus, it's actually real. I can look at it on the real axis. I'm not, this function doesn't make sense on the real axis here, but outside for, for Z real and greater than lambda plus, this function makes sense. And it's monotonically decreasing uh, as, as all steel just transform should be. Uh, remember, maybe it's easier to, if I look at the integral form, it's easier to see if I write G of Z as integral rho of lambda z minus lambda from lambda minus to lambda plus z lambda. If I look for z greater, real and greater than lambda plus, 
uh, this is a monotically decreasing function that tends to one over z. Okay, so here, so this is rho of lambda. And if I plot g of z, well, g of x, so g of z on the real axis, it starts with some value uh, and then decrease as g of x goes to one over x. Okay, which means that it's invertible. That's very important that these fun this function, if I go from x to infinity up to lambda plus, this is a monotonic function, I can invert this function. Okay, and the invert is, the invert is, is very, very useful. That's why I kept this formula here because I could read off the inverse just from this, from this formula. So the inverse g of z is z of g. So z of g is just um, uh, one over z, g plus sigma squared g. Okay, so the inverse of the Seelgeist transform for real values beyond, um, and I'll call this number, this quantity g star, so if you want, G of Z um, is monotonic. Uh, it, uh, so, so, so G becomes smaller and smaller and smaller. So Z of G uh, increases as I increase G. And so this, this is well-defined for G between zero and G star. Okay, so. So it's uh, so there's 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 a there's a neighborhood of zero where this function is invertible. Okay, why is that important? So I want to finish very very quickly with something that should take uh, many hours to explain: uh, the concept of freeness. Which um, okay. So oh, one thing I forgot to mention, but I'll be looking a lot at matrices that are rotationally invariant. Okay, what's a, what's a random matrix that's rotationally invariant? It means that if I take, say, a matrix A, and I consider a random rotation O, A, O transpose, that these two are equal in law. Mean, meaning that, if the, that, it, that the probability of a matrix A is, as, 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 is the same probability as any rotation of the matrix A. This would, be, this would say that the ensemble A is rotationally invariant. And I will, and so, so concept of freeness is a, it's a well, it's a, com, a concept that it's used um, if you deal with um, sort of algebras of non-commuting objects. Uh, uh, you, there's a notion of independence for non-commuting object that, that's very powerful, it's called freeness. Uh, and I'm not gonna go into the algebra of it, but it turns out that large rotationally invariant matrices are, are free. So I would say that A and B are free with respect to one another. And I'll tell you what, what, why it's useful, but I just want to define A and B are free if they're large matrices. In practice, it's only true at infinity, okay? The, 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 uh, any matrix of size N, the notion of freeness doesn't exist, is not true at size N, but asymptotically as N goes to infinity, this, what I'm gonna say is true, and at least, one is rotationally invariant. Okay, so for instance, if I take A plus a random matrix, uh, the random matrix O, B, O transpose, by multiplying by a random rotation matrix, this, this, this I made B, I, I explicitly made B rotation invariant, okay? And so any matrix A could be a fixed matrix, or it could be a, a Wigner matrix, or it could be, a, so we'll, in the next hour, we'll discuss about Wishart matrix. It could, it could be any, any matrix. And then I take B, again, any matrix, it could be random, it could be fixed, but I multiply by a random rotation. By here, O is a, is a rotation for, for, there's another language uh, uh, taken from the, the Haar measure on the, the orthogonal group. And of course, this is true as well for unitary matrices, if I'm looking at complex emission matrices. Okay. So if A and B are free, uh, if they have these two properties, if, if they're large and at least one of them is rotation invariant that I can make explicitly, then I can compute this object, C, the sum of the two matrices. Okay. 
at least I can, I, can, I, can say, I can say many things about the matrix C, which would be the sum. Okay, so remember in, in classical probability distribution, if I have a random number A and a random number B, if I take this, if I say C equals A plus B, so these are, are classical random numbers, I can say something about C if A and B are independent. Okay, and, and then C will be the convolution of the law of A. The law of C will be the convolution of the law of A and the law of B. Okay, for, for non commuting objects, there's a similar notion, it's a similar but different. It gives different results and gives different uh, law of large numbers. Many different things are different. And this is called the, uh, the notion of free probability. But what I want to say is that for it, it, and it applies to large matrices with, where one of them is rotationally invariant. And one thing I can say, there's a, the, the, the function R that will define in a moment. I can say that R of the matrix X will be equal to R of the matrix A plus R of the matrix B. Okay, so there, there exists a function that characterizes the, the spectrum of the matrix C, and this function is additive. Okay, and this is extremely useful because if I can go from the spectrum to R and from R to the spectrum, well, knowing the spectrum of A and B, if I take a rotationally invariant combination of A and B, I sum them, I can compute the spectrum of the sum. Okay. And the, the reason I insist on the fact that the Seelge transform is invertible is because the function R is directly related to the inverse of the Seelge transform. Okay. So I want to finish and then we can do, go for the coffee break with, with this fact. So this function, this, this wonderful function that's additive uh, for free, uh, for, for addition of free objects is defined as R, uh, let me write as R of G is this function Z of G. So with G, Z of G is the inverse of uh, G of Z. Okay, so I take the limiting steel just transform uh, on the real axis, but away from the eigenvalues. It's invertible, and I call this function uh, z of g. And it turns out this function always has a pole. Uh, it always starts as one over g. So in the R transform, actually, you remove this pole minus one over g, and then it becomes an analytical function of uh, it's it, it's regular and zero. Okay. So let's do this just for for this uh, for the uh, the Wigner ensemble. For the Wigner ensemble, I have that z of g is one over G plus Sigma squared G. And so the R transform, I just get rid of the one over G. So I have that R for a Wigner matrix X of G is simply given by Sigma squared G. Okay, this is obviously the simplest R transform. Okay, um, every, every other random matrix ensemble will have a much more complicated. Uh, and, but this is natural because the Wigner ensemble is a bunch of, of Gaussian random numbers and the central limit theorem on, on Gaussian random numbers. And it turns out that if you sum a lot of random matrices, you end up with a Wigner matrix. So there's a central limit theorem that I won't go into the, the detail, but if you add a bunch of, of randomly rotated um, matrices and you rescale them to keep the variance constant, basically you'll get rid of, you'll, you'll, you'll start maybe with a very complicated R function but by adding and scaling and adding and scaling, you get a central limit theorem and you converge to this, okay? And then from this, once you know the, uh, the R transform, you can just go back here, add back a, the pole at one over G, invert the function, and you, you get the, the Stilgis transform of your ensemble C. And then you look at the imaginary part of that on the real axis and you get the density. So this is how you compute say sums of a, uh, of uh, random variable. Oh, I want, there's one more thing I want to say. I won't use it for, for the addition, but uh, in, the, in the next hour, I'll talk about multiplication. It's, it's called a subordination relation. So it, it, this equation here, well, this combined with this, I can rewrite it that if I look at the Stilgis transform, so I put G of C of, Z, of some variable Z, this is just, it's really just some algebra. I take this formula and this formula, I recombine them. I get this nice formula that G A of Z minus R B of G C of Z. Okay, trust me, you can do you can do it as an exercise. Try to combine 
this and this. Okay. And you have that the, the Sturgis transform of the matrix C at some point is equal to the, the Sturgis transform of the matrix A, but at a different point. And of course, this different point is, is a, it's a nasty implicit equation because the point at which you need to evaluate depends on the R transform of B, and, but also on the Sturgis transform that you're trying to, to get to. Okay. So this by itself, um, well, it's useful, but uh, not super useful. Now, what, what, turn, what turns out, if I go back to my big resolvent, so I had, I had this matrix, uh, big G of C, which was defined as Z identity minus the matrix C inverse. This is a, this is a random object. Okay, this is a, a, a n-square uh, dimensional object, so it's random. In, in, in no way it converges uh, to anything in particular. So now, now I, I explicitly need to take the expectation value. But if I look at this expression here of C, which is given by A and B, I can take the expectation value with respect to, the, to, to this object here. B could be itself random. Or, or just expectation value with respect to these random rotations, and has this beautiful relation that's the same as this, but now for a large matrix, but, but in expectation value, I have the expectation value of this resolvent matrix GC of Z equals the resolvent matrix of A, which I, I, assume, I assume A is fixed. If it's not fixed, then it's condition on A. Uh, evaluate it. it's the same expression. Okay, so what does it mean? Well, there, there are two consequences. Well, GA is a matrix built from A. So it commutes with A. It's, 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 a, it's a multiple of identity. Well, this is for C, but for A is the same thing, same expression. So it's a multiple of identity, the matrix A, some inverse. So this is a matrix, it's a, it's a large matrix that commutes with A. C is a matrix that's built from A and some random stuff. So it's usually C doesn't commute with A, but in expectation value, it does. So one beautiful thing, and it's, it sort of makes sense just um, why the C in expectation value commutes with A, because so again, the random matrix C doesn't, matri doesn't, doesn't commute with A. I add something random, but think in the basis of A. So A, we're in the basis where A is diagonal. C is something diagonal plus something random. But something random that's rotation invariant cannot have off-diagonal elements on average. Of course, on one particular realization, it will have off-diagonal elements. But on average, the off the, there's kind of a symmetry. Anything that you put off the diagonal, you could flip some axis and it will, you, will, you will put the same thing with the minus sign. So the average of the off diagonal elements are zero. Okay. So it's important the expectation value of C conditioned to A is in the same basis of A. And this is a set, it's, well, this, this states more than that, but what's implied here is that, and, okay. And why is all this important? because uh, I'm going to talk about eigenvector problems. And if when I'm going to try to, to look at eigenvectors of matrices, remember that this, this big matrix G, it's a projector. It's a, it's a projector on each of the eigenvectors. Okay? And so I'll need to compute uh, expectations of projectors and I'll, I'll need this formula. Okay? So um, definitely on Wednesday, well, there's, a, there's, a, there's a similar uh, formula for multiplic matrix multiplication that I'll show later. And if I want to look at eigenvectors of, of matrices that have been multiplied, this expression is extremely uh, useful. And I think I should stop here and ask for questions or coffee break. Thanks. Any questions or, or you can ask them here. Or Jean, any questions from the... From, no, from... There were no questions. I think you're very clear, okay. <laughs> at least to me. Sorry, I was a bit fast, but this is sort of material that people should know in random matrix theory. Yeah. I think it was really a great introduction for everything we we're going to do. Actually, we will know much more about free probability with Kami, right? So it's, uh... Okay. All right, so we have a coffee break upstairs on the terrace, I think, and we start, let's, let's be there around 10.40 or, okay, see you.